the other weeks we also we've been reading you know Galatians 22 through 25 does anybody have that memorized by now well if anybody wants to stand up and do it you can that's fine if you do have Galatians 5 22 through 25 memorized okay <laughs> but that's uh, just so you know we are still speaking on the fruit of the spirit uh, and there's several scriptures about gentleness but the one today in addition to Galatians 5 the one I kind of brought out was this one from Matthew 11 it's, a, it's really a, a comforting verse Jesus saying "All come to me all you who are weary and burdened I, I think sometimes in the back of our minds we're afraid that when we come to Christ or come to come to Maybe we've tried to start coming back to church again. Maybe we've, we've just come to Jesus. We're afraid that we're going to be burdened when we come to Jesus. But let me, let me, I have some news for you. You're already burdened. You're, there's sin you already, there's something that you let direct your life. But Jesus says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light because he's gentle and he's humble of heart. And that speaks to us of who Christ is and who we're called to be. So we are, in Galatians 5, we're commended to have the fruit of gentleness. We're commended to be gentle, and because this reflects Christ. And what we saw here in, in Matthew 11, what Kyle just read, is Kyle, uh, not Kyle, Kyle doesn't issue an invitation to come to him for his yoke as he, uh, maybe Kyle does, I don't know, but, but Jesus <laughs> Oh, never mind. I had a thought go through my head. <laughs> Jesus issues the invitation to come to him, come to him all who are weary. He issues an invitation, and then he gives his gentleness as the reason to accept the invitation. He says, come, and you know you can come, you know you can trust coming to me, because I am gentle and humble of heart. He gives his gentleness as the reason for the invitation, the reason why people should accept this invitation to come. Because they're not going to find a harsh taskmaster there. They're going to find a gentle Savior. And from that gentleness, people will find rest for their souls. And so it's not an image of Christ beating people over the head with their burdens or with their sins. It's an image of Christ welcoming people. And then one by one, he peels off the burdens. He peels off the baggage that we bring. And instead, he places on them a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. For those who, aren't, who don't know that word today, a yoke is something they would put on oxen, okay, to, get, to direct them, you know. And so it's Jesus does direct you, but his burden is easy, much easier than the things we bring to him. So Christ, he could compel someone to come. He could force somebody to come. He could, he could have them come and then sort of bind them up and sort of restrict what they do, restrict their movement. He could force them to accept his way. He could make them lay down their burdens. He could slap the burdens out of their hand. He could, he could do something more forcefully. He could force them to accept their healing. But instead... Christ gives us a picture of gentleness. Now why is that? Why does God work that way? Why does God work by invitation, work by wooing, work by sort of this idea of inviting someone in rather than by just forcing them? And I think it's this, because when you love someone, you don't want to force them to love you. But... You want to invite them and for them to accept your love from their desire rather than from your compulsion. When I married Jess, I didn't want her to feel like she was forced to marry me because that wouldn't really say she loved me like I loved her. It was, it was something where we wanted to invite each other to love one another. And I think God's love has something like that to it. I think that's why God wants us to love him from our desire rather than his compelling us to love him. And furthermore, God loves us in this way and Jesus invites us in this way 
Because when someone is wounding themselves, if someone, let's say, has an addiction, and let's say you do force them to stop, you compel them to stop, the minute they come out from under your compulsion, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go back to doing it again. There's some in this house who know what I'm talking about. There's some in this house who have been that person. Your parents were on you about something, and the minute they turned away, what would you do? You went back and did it. <laughs> But Christ invites us instead. And he invites us to have, live this life of invitation too. And if you don't force somebody to, to, to come your way, but if you invite them with gentleness, they'll want to lay down their sin. They'll want to lay down their weapons. And then they will trust you enough as you help them not take up those weapons again. There's a difference. It's an invitation that your heart surrenders to rather than a force that you're compelled to give up in front of. And so, gentleness is the vehicle with which God administers His love. God loves us. He could show that love in a lot of different ways. And He chooses gentleness. It's a posture that causes us to draw towards God rather than run from Him in fear. It is... To be honest with you, we think of gentleness as weak. It isn't that. No, it's strength. Gentleness is strength, but it's controlled and harnessed, not for forcing someone, but for loving them to the uttermost. You take all the force and all the strength that you have, and you don't put it into binding them up and forcing them to come with you. You put it instead into, into once they come, loving them to the uttermost and showing them where life is. Gentleness is an invitation it's a showing of your heart to someone even when their heart hasn't turned to you. So, so just in life, maybe you've, maybe you've experienced before being gentle when someone's been mean to you. Because your heart for them isn't harm. If you're a Christian, your heart for them is life. So gentleness means showing them your desire for them, your heart for them, even when their heart hasn't turned to you. Even when, let's say, they're mean to you. Gentleness is, is showing, you know, like we, we're often gentle with children. Gentleness is, is showing children not only not to touch the, the stove, but then they see why, because they see in our, our command that we love them. Reminds me, when I was a kid, my mom had a pan of tacos and said, don't touch this pan, and I reached up and went, you know, and I touched the pan, and it burned, you know. But we're gentle with children because we, if we just force them, They'll do it, but it's something about forcing them creates and then this kind of this, this sort of resentment or this, this it doesn't really teach them that, that we love them and show them the reason why we're teaching them. Gentleness shows our heart to someone before they even turn to us. And that's God's gentleness. It shows His love and His desire for us even before we turn to Him. And that's who we're called to be. And it operates by that invitation. I used to be a, a teacher in middle school, and my first semester of teaching, I tried the different techniques of getting kids to do what I want, um, which is an art, by the way. It's a tremendously difficult art when you're dealing with 30 middle schoolers, it turns out. And I was kind of inexperienced, so, and I heard some other teachers do this, so for a while, with a couple of my bad kids, I tried loudness and kind of scaring them and kind of threatening and, and I realized something. They would do what I want but it didn't make them want in the future to do what I want because they didn't like doing what I want because it made them resent me and I came to realize that. And I realized you have to draw a student with gentleness because deep down your job isn't just to get them to do the task in front of them. Your job is to get them to learn. Your job is to get them in the future on their own to do what they're supposed to do. And they're only going to do that if they know you like them. They're only going to do that if you know you actually care about them. And then they'll want to do what you ask them to do. And that's what gentleness does. It invites them and draws them. I remember there was one kid I had trouble with. And I mean, he, he was just a stinker, you know. And, and um, I mean, I can just objectively say that. He was a stinker. I'm sure he's a good kid now. Well, he's like... 30 now. But anyway, yeah. But any, this kid, I mean, I would just try to force him to do stuff, you know, and, and, and just because he just wouldn't behave. And, and I put more and more punishments on it and stuff. And it just occurred to me one day, you know, this, 
this kid has no incentive now to do what I want because he thinks that I just totally hate him, you know. I can't say I was a fan of him, you know. But it occurred to me, these kids got to know I love them and care about them. And that only comes by, in, in the middle of me telling them what to do, in the middle of me even sending them to the dean's office. I kind of took on this idea of I want to be firm, but then let them know in the middle of it that I care. I think something in that is gentleness. There's always this invitation back to, hey, why don't you, okay, go to the office, but when you come back tomorrow, we'll try again. Like, it's this invitation to come to my way, not because I want to harm you, not because I want to restrict you, but because there's a better way. And I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you. And I think God shows us that. That's what gentleness is. It's not forcing someone. It's inviting them. And then in the midst of it, even before they turn to you, showing them your heart for them. That's why we move in gentleness. Now, I could just say right now, and this is a very simple sermon, okay, let the Spirit create that in you and go and do. Amen. Go and be blessed. Have a wonderful lunch. And so let me actually start off and say that. Let the Spirit create that in you. Go and do. But don't have a wonderful lunch yet, okay? Because there's one other caveat I want to give you today before you go. And this actually will end up being a short sermon. So that's, that'll be a, you know, you won't have to wait as long at, at lunch. Yes, let the Spirit foster gentleness inside of you. Yes. Treat people with the heart you desire for them. Not don't don't force them. You know because it, you know the minute you turn away, they're going to turn back to what they're doing. But here's the other thing. Not only I think are we called to be gentle. I feel led to say to, to you today as Christians, don't do the other thing. Don't do the opposite of gentleness. Don't be harsh. Let's as a community, as a as a family of believers. Let's not turn to the tactics of our culture in order to win our culture. Our culture, 21st century American culture, you know what that's driven by? It's driven by, hey, we, we want to win, right? And what the culture says is, nice guy, what's the saying? Nice guys finish last. Nice guys win, don't win, let's say. Gentle people perhaps, don't win. And so you and I are raised in the culture we're raised in. There's a part of us we love putting down, laying down the law. It kind of feels good, right? We love laying down the law. We love telling it how it is. We like to fight for our right to party or what have you. Eight, you know, music fans in the room. We like to, to fight for our rights whether to do, to, you know, whether it's to bear arms or to pray where we want to pray or to have people see things our way. We, we want to fight for those things, not just Christians, anybody in our culture. We, we love to sort of fight for our rights. But listen, if that's all we do, as soon as we don't have our thumb on the problem at, at hand, the people that we've been arguing with are going to go the other way. You don't win anybody to Christ by forcing them to see it your way. It just doesn't work. And so I just want to beg you as, as this family of believers here in Enterprise today, I want to beg you as Christians to live a life of invitation of people to Christ rather than a life of compelling people and forcing them to see things your way. However, at the same time, while we're not called to force things on people, we're not called to give in to evil either. You and I were not called to just stand by as we see our family members or somebody bound up in addiction and we can't just let them die. We're not called to just let our kids go down a path that's hurting them and we don't raise a peep about it. Don't mistake. That's not gentleness. That's avoidance. Avoidance and gentleness aren't the same thing. Nor in the wider society are we called to avoid other issues, whether it's you know, areas where we see Christ push out, pushed out of spaces where in the past, you know, he used to be allowed, whether you're thinking of prayer in school or prayer at a football game or sort of those hot button topics. We're not called to avoid them. But then also we're not called to force our way either. So what are, what are we called to do? How are we called to walk in this world where we don't want to force our hand, but we don't want to avoid the issue? We're called to gentleness. It's a third way. It's a different way. Matthew 10, 16. 
it talks about this. Jesus says that we're called to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Some translations render that innocent as doves as gentle as doves, simple, gentle, innocent. And so I think it illustrates for us how we're called to be in this world. We don't turn a blind eye to the issues going on in our family or in our world. Nor do we try to subjugate the world or people until they see things our way. No, we, we stay wise, but we proceed with the gentleness, Jesus said, of a dove. We proceed with a posture of love and invitation. And when you, when you proceed with that posture, it means you walk carefully. You're careful to hear every word from God in a situation. So you know the right amount to confront someone and the right amount to welcome them in. And we do that until they see Christ in us and are drawn to his invitation. And when you, when you approach people and situations with that attitude, I think it brings about a transformation in people and in the world that lasts far longer than anything we could force. An example of that I'd like to, uh, there's two examples I'd like to give you when you're thinking about that. Normally we say, you know, might is right. If you want something, you fight for it in this world, and, and then that, it becomes that way. Let's take that back to the 1950s and 60s. Let's imagine the civil rights movement if they had gone by that ethic rather than the ethic they went by. The ethic of, of African Americans in this country who'd been, who'd been maligned, segregated, pushed to the wayside. Let's say they decided to force their view and, and their rights. You would have had a war, right? And some people would have said, you know what? We would have deserved it. But instead, what won the day? You had people like Dr. Martin Luther King who, to, who chose, no, we're not going to avoid the issue, but we're not going to force people to have it our way. We're going to do a third way. We're going to do this way of peaceful protest and action. And we're, yes, we're going to break the law. We're going to go into places that are segregated. But then to show them our, our purity of, of cause, we're going to be willing to, to go to jail when we break those laws because we believe they're unjust laws. That's the way of gentleness. And that's the way that won. You know, we don't look back at the 50s and 60s and say that there was this massive, you know, race war in America. You know, there were people who, who thought that would happen. You had like the Black Panthers and people like that. <laughs> Instead, this other way was found. And I believe it's the way of Christ, which said, we're not going to avoid the issue, but we're going to confront it, but we're going to do it in a way that makes people take notice by our good behavior, by our our bravery, our courage to stand up to what's wrong. And so you had people go to jail, you had people face beatings, but they themselves didn't give back violence in that way. And what happens over time? People see what happens and they're invited to start seeing these people as human beings, which is what they are. And they're invited to start seeing their viewpoint and seeing that they've been excluded and, start, and they start to hear them for the first time. And then now, without massive bloodshed, without massive civil war, social upheaval, we live in a society now, we're not perfect, there's still racism, there's still those things, but we live in a society now at least where schools are integrated, right? And we, we're living up to the ideals, at least in American culture, of the Declaration of Independence, all people created equal. You know, that happened because there was an avoidance there wasn't violence and forcing somebody to see the issue. I call it the way of gentleness. Was it weak? Heck no, it wasn't weak. It was strong. But it was a posture of, here I am, I'm a human being. It was a posture of invitation. Inviting people to make right what had been wrong. Another example of this, I'd say, is Jesus Christ and the early Christians. You tell me if this is the craziest world domination plan you've ever heard. God says, I want to take over the world. So I'm going to send a baby, okay? 
not just a baby. I'm going to send him to the poorest place on the earth, to one of the most forgotten people on earth. Oh, and they'll be under occupation by one of the strongest empires ever. It's just got to work, right? And then I'm going to raise that baby up and he'll become a man. And no, he won't go and, and take over the government. He won't have, you know, bring down a lightning bolt on Caesar or do something and, or, or to, to all of a sudden bring the Roman Empire. Instead, what he'll do is he'll get 12 dudes. Uh, not smart dudes. We'll just get fishermen, okay? Yeah, that's got to work. This is a wonderful plan to take over the world. He's going to get 12 fishermen. He's going to get a tax collector. And you know what? He's going he's gonna to make himself already... He's already in sort of this, this sideline culture. He's going to become sidelined within that culture. This is my plan for world domination. You wouldn't think that would work. But Jesus Christ came and he didn't bring a revolt. He didn't overthrow the Roman Empire. He didn't come and with, with lightning and with the sword. He came as the lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. And he had 12 people that he took his disciples and had them learn. And when he died on the cross, he rose again. And what he said to those 12 people wasn't, go overthrow Caesar now. This pagan government above you that's ruining, that's ruining you know, this world, go and overthrow them now. What did he say? And he didn't say, turn away from the world and just wait for me to come back. What did he say in Matthew 28? He just said, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've commanded you to do, and I will be with you to the end of the age. That's a picture of gentleness. It didn't avoid the world, nor did it try to force everybody to all of a sudden become a Christian. It just said, go and make disciples. You know, that was the year 33 A.D. As you know, by the year... 315 A.D., the majority of the Roman Empire was Christian. Did you know that? Didn't happen through a war. Didn't happen through a violent takeover. It happened through people being invited to Jesus Christ and then inviting others. As a matter of fact, in the places in the world where people were forced to become a Christian, you know, those are actually the places right now where Christianity is suffering. You maybe have heard the of the Crusades. You know, where the Crusades take, took place, it's hard to find a Christian there anymore. Gentleness is inviting someone to Christ. Gentleness is, is inviting someone to the love of God because that invitation, when someone accepts that invitation, it will cause them to be more permanently transformed than anything you could ever force them to do. And so today, there's kind of two parts in this sermon. If you're in this room and you're not a Christian, or you're in this room and you're not sure if you're a Christian, or if you're just sort of standing on the, on the edge wondering about this Jesus thing and you wonder if you step in, the minute you step in, you're going to be tied up and, and you're going to have to do churchy things. Lord, have mercy on us. You're going to have to you know, go to church and go to... I don't know what people do at church. I'm a pastor and I don't know. <laughs> You're going, to have to, you're going to have to do the churchy thing. It's going to be this burdensome thing where you're going to be forced to do things. Here's what I want to tell you today. Matthew 11, where Jesus was saying, come to me, he shows us that's a lie. That's not what Christianity is. If you're here in this room today and you don't know Christ or, or you've been wondering if, if you know him and you stand on the outside, what the Bible is showing us today, is the minute you step into Christ, it's not him binding you, you up for the first time in your life. It's him freeing you. You have nothing to be afraid of. Why? Because his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and he's gentle of heart. God loves you. He wants to show you that love through this invitation, through the warmth of your reception. He wants you to know he has always been your heavenly father. He has always loved you more than you love yourself. He's always wanted better for you than what you wanted for yourself. So today, hear that today. And he has never forced you to accept it. He just has kept laying it out and laying it out, laying it out. Today, let it be one more time. He's laying out in front of you the invitation and he's saying, I love you. Why don't you lay those other things down for a while and come home because I love you. 
Now, if you are a Christian in the room, the other thing today, the other, I think, invitation is for you to live that life of invitation. We're called to call people to Christ by living lives of warmth, of gentleness, of invitation that entice people to come. They will never get there by you forcing them. They will never get there by you, you berating them. You and I are called to live this life of invitation that speaks of that good God whose yoke is easy, whose burden is light. Today, a spirit-led people. May we have love, may we have joy, may we have peace, patience, kindness, may we have all those things. But the vehicle that it comes in May it come with gentleness. Because it's gentleness that will attract people so they can actually see how loving and joyful you are and more importantly how loving God is. Let gentleness be the vehicle with which we show our love to the world. So that God's kingdom will come here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray together. I want to invite the worship team to come up. Lord, I thank you for your gentleness that invites us home. I thank you, God, when you, you could force us to do whatever you want, Lord. You love us so much that instead you just invite us. You invite us like a parent inviting their child. God, I pray today we would surrender to you. If there's areas in our lives where we haven't surrendered, that we'd surrender to your gentleness and to your goodness. And God calls us as well to be people that don't force people, Lord, to love you. Instead, let us live such radical lives that every word we say, every step we take is an invitation to know you. And people will just be drawn to you through us and be changed forever. Lord, give us your gentleness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand?